Uh, my name is Leroy Peterson, and um, I was born in Regina, Saskatchewan, in Canada, in the year of 1937. Boy, how old does that make me? Well, 78. I'm getting up there. Doesn't seem like it. Uh, I was the oldest of uh, four children. My dad was a minister. And uh, the only pictures I have of me up there, I'm bundled up, I look like a penguin. It's just, you know, round and uh, s snow on the ground. And my dad used to tell me, he said, he said, if you spit, it was so cold in the wintertime, it'll turn to an icicle before it hits the ground. I still remember him telling me that. Well, I think it was about just between about four or five when we moved to New York City. And my other brother was born there. My dad was pastor of the Norwegian church. His both my grandparents came from Norway, and he spoke it very well. Uh, my youngest brother was born in Washington, D.C., at the sanitarium there. My dad was studying there a little bit. And uh, my sister was born overseas in Singapore. Well, after Washington, we moved to Oregon for three years. And then my dad got a call to go to the mission field and accepted it. So we packed all our belongings, and, and in those days you didn't fly over, you went by boat, and it took weeks to get over. Stopped in various places, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and the Philippines, and so on, each port. Um, I remember as we were going, they, they told my dad, he said, bring a car along, because you'll need some, some transportation over there, and this was about 1946. Um, so then at the last minute, they said, no, don't bring it. You can buy a car cheaper over there. And we were already on our way down to the, catch the boat. And so my dad called up somebody, and the guy said, I'll buy it. It was a, it was a I forgot the year, but it was a Hudson, a green Hudson. So when we got there, they had already taken the gangplank away. And here, all our, all our luggage and boxes and fruit, everything was already on the ship. The gangplank was gone, and the ship was getting ready to pull out. So we, <laughs> I still remember my dad frantically waving, come running up there. So they put the gangplank back down, and we all got on. Well, that was a kind of a trip that was really hard on my stomach because I, I don't take rides, you know. Up and that, I remember spending hours looking over over the edge of the the boat into the ocean because if my eyes followed the waves, I was fine. Well, um, in Singapore, in those days, it was not too long after the uh, Second World War ended, and there was a lot of reminiscent things, Japanese money, the Japanese uh, had ruled the country at that time. And, uh, but it was quite an adventure. I mean, it was totally different than what the first 10 years of my life were like. But my dad was, was uh, wanting me to, cont to start with my music, so I started violin lessons with a Dutch teacher who had been interned during the war and he stayed there. So I took lessons from him and um, made very rapid progress. Um, and within a few years, um, let's see, I was about 15, my folks decided to ship me over to Cologne to study at the Geneva Conservatory, which is right close to the, our school there. So um, my teacher in Singapore was, uh, was an overweight, cigar smoking, <laughs> but he was ins inspirational, you know, he, he passed away not, you know, not too many years after I left, but uh, he was very inspiring to me, and within, within two years I passed grade five from the London Royal Schools of Music, and the next year I passed grade seven, and I was on my way. So I went to, uh, they packed me up, I was taking some French lessons for a couple of weeks, it didn't really help much. So I landed in Paris and um, had my one suitcase and my fiddle and got on a train. They had it made on arrangements to go to Cologne, and I went on and on and on and on. Finally, after I've forgotten it, half a day or so, I asked somebody, where's the stop for Cologne? Couldn't find anybody who would understand me. Finally, somebody came. I said, oh, you missed the stop hours and hours ago. So. I had to catch another train back, and I got off of Cologne, and it was around midnight. And it was just a rinky-dink station, nobody was there, and I so took my bags off, and there I was, all by myself. Not a soul around there, nobody. 
strange country, strange language. I had no idea where the school was or how to get there. There was no taxis. There was nothing. Well, it just so happened. Um, I always, my dad always told me, he says, always, you know, make sure you pray. God will direct your way and no matter what the circumstance, there was always a solution. And um, my dad was um, in charge of the Voice of Prophecy in Singapore and he lay activities director and so on. So I prayed to the Lord, I said, what am I gonna do? Here I am. Well, it just so happened that someone came up from the school to get some luggage at the, the next train we had brought. And, and they saw me, and so they took me there to Cologne. Well, anyway, I spent a year there. And I can't go on the details. Um, I came from Singapore with no winter clothes, just shorts. And <laughs> I remember my, my fingers got so cold um, that they began to crack, you know, from the, from the cold and the dryness. Um, there were times when I um, would go down to my lesson and uh, finally, my teacher, after a, a few short lessons, I came in one day and he said, we're finished. He didn't speak, he was German, he didn't speak too much, too much English. This was at the Geneva Conservatory. I said, finished? He said, you're not practicing. He said, I'm not gonna teach you, you're wasting my time. I thought, wow, I came all the way from Singapore to study with the best teacher and now he's kicking me out. So I pleaded with him. I said, please give me one more chance. So he said, okay. So I went home, I practiced. I got up early in the morning before any, I was staying with some, so some friends, the music teachers. I went down in the furnace room so it wouldn't disturb anybody. I started at five o'clock in the morning. I practiced all day long. My fingers were sore and my chin was sore. And they had a school picnic the uh, first day of school, I think, or a week after, and I skipped that to practice. Well, the next week I went for my lesson, and he seemed satisfied. He says, okay, he says, you're making progress. So I practiced my head off, and I, I, I really went for it. Well, I'm gonna skip ahead briefly here. Years later, when I was uh, in graduate school in Baltimore, the uh, Berlin Philharmonic came to perform in the city and he was concertmaster of the orchestra. Michel Schwalbe was his name. So I knew he was gonna be there. I thought, well, this is great. By this time, I was uh, in my mid-20s. And um, I went backstage after the concert. And he was getting, putting on his big fur coat. It was a winter time. And I said, Michel Schwalbe, do you remember me? And he looked, he couldn't, he didn't, it didn't seem like. Then I said, do you remember Le Roi? Le Roi is the way my name is pronounced in, in French, Le King. And he said, Le Roi. And he ran up to me and he gave me a big hug. And then this is the thing that shocked me. He said, you know, you were one of the very best students I've ever had in my life. And I thought I was the worst. He never encouraged me. So anyway, I was going to graduate school there at the time and uh, the year after I came back from Singapore, I was fortunate to perform with the National Symphony Orchestra when I was about 17, I guess it was, between the ages of 16 and 17. That was a real thrill uh, to do that. Um, from graduate school, after I got my graduate degrees, I went to uh, Pioneer Valley Academy to teach. My dad and my folks were actually in South Lancaster. Uh, my dad was uh, working for the conference there. And um, shortly thereafter, they packed up and went to Africa. Uh, they hadn't been in the mission field for I don't know, 12 years in Singapore. And then they spent another 10 years in Africa later. So um, my daughter, Shelley, was born in uh, Massachusetts, Pioneer Valley Academy. So those were really pleasant days. It was relaxed and uh, there was not any pressure. It was just you know, my first teaching job, and we had a brand new home. We just rattled around in it. It was kind of neat. The sad thing, within 10 or 15, 15 years, that school folded because of bad management, and they sold the school, so it's no longer in existence. It, they used, I think, the uh, police academy bought it, and they used the homes as, as target practice for 
and so on. Well, anyway, after three years, I got a call to, to teach at Andrews University. And uh, so we decided it was time to move on. And I was asked to uh, direct a chamber orchestra and teach theory and some other miscellaneous things. But you, you, you end up doing more than what, what you expected to do. I had ended up teaching conducting and a s survey of, what well, they call it, enjoyment of music and uh, other subjects. But I spent 15 years there. So, um, you know, that, that was a great place. On the way down, my, um, before we left, when we left Pioneer Valley Academy, uh, my son Todd was born at the Washington Sand. We were ba basically on our way out here. And we stopped there and he, he was born. So I have a son and a daughter. Um, so we've spent, we spent 15 years there and then I got a call to come out to Pacific Union College. And uh, it seemed the right thing to do. And uh, so we accepted the call, came out here. Actually, I'd had two other calls to come out here and I turned them both down. It was exp it's expensive to live out here and finding a house and all, we had a nice place there and so on. The third time the call came, I said, <sighs> I prayed about it and we figured it was time that we should accept it. I said, it's like baseball, three strikes and you're out. If I don't take this one, I'm out. <laughs> so we, we came out here and it's been 32 years and it's been a wonderful experience. Now I'm still teaching part-time world music, but during the years um, we were here, I had the fortune of uh, doing a lot of travel overseas. Uh, first with a school, I took uh, our string quartet. We traveled over to Scandinavia, and we traveled to, uh, let's see, the Far East, we were in Borneo, and uh, Taiwan, China, I made a trip to China as well with an orchestra. So we, we went to a lot of different places. One year I took my family, my Shelley and Todd, they both sing. And Todd plays the piano very well. And we gave tours all the way through uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. We had places to stay, and so that was a, a wonderful thing. It's great to be able to travel with your family. Imagine that, you know, your adult kids, and you still we enjoy being to get together. My son and daughter both graduated from PUC and both of them taught here. Todd taught math for a while and Shelley taught uh, English and French. Todd was a student missionary in Pakistan and Shelley was, went to school in Cologne. So um, they're both in the area. Um, Shelley is the office manager at the PUC church. And Todd works for IT at the St. Helena Hospital and several other hospitals. He's the IT director. I have three grandchildren. The ages, two boys are, Shelley has a boy eight. Todd has a son who's eight and a half and a five and a half year old daughter. I, we enjoy them so much, you know, it's really great to see the next generation come along. I long for the day, however, when I think of all the friends around the world and people I've met and so on and separated, I'm longing for the day when we meet in God's kingdom, we'll never be separated. And the most important thing is, is to see Jesus, to worship him face to face, to sit at that table and eat of the tree of life. And, and all the people, your friends and neighbors, we could spend years and years just re getting reacquainted, you know, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And so all of the hardships and all of the difficulties you have on this earth is nothing could compare to what lies before us. And uh, we put up a lot of things, and uh, sometimes it's difficult, but I think if we're faithful, you know, we will see it through. 